So we're looking at the public health crews, and I'm going to be as quick as I can today because everybody's ill <laughs> and lunch is off. So, yeah. Let me be as brief as I can and on the point. It's about um, hardship. Now, Hebrews is written to a bunch of second generation Jewish background believers in Jesus. And they've all got pushy Jewish mothers. Because that's their background. Even pushier, perhaps, Jewish grandmothers are forced to be reckoned with in the world. And the situation they're in, in their, in their experience, is this. The clear, radical, exciting days of their community of Jewish Christians has passed away in the second generation. So the days when all the Zach Bang Wallop big stuff was going on in the past, and their second generation believers, they've always been brought up with these ideas. They learned their Christianity from their parents being raised in Jewish Christian homes. And now, stoked by their grannies and their aunties, the old ways in Judaism have a very strong, fresh appeal. And they're threatening to draw them back to a less godly past. With the religion of their ancestors. And more than that, their experience of life following Christ poses challenges that wouldn't be posed to them if they were just good Jewish lads. Life's hard, and their experience of hardship will have one of two possible effects on them. It will either bring them closer to God or drive them further from Him. Now you find this with all sorts of people in all sorts of walks of life. Hard experiences come on, and it will have one of two effects on somebody. It will either drive you further into rebelliousness and bitterness against God, or it will drive you the other way. I've seen people, people you wouldn't expect, stand and shake their fist at heaven and curse at God. Tiger people. And other people under the same or harder experience turn to him. Hardship can be one of those things that actually cleaves humanity down the middle in terms of its relationship, its response to it. Which way are you going to go? Which way is going to be best? They are coming under pressure. And there are some of them who, of course, it's bringing closer to him in dependence and trust because they sense their need of him to bring them through it. Or they will... The other lot of them, they, they're becoming embittered. Blaming God for their troubles. A God that they deny. That's interesting, isn't it? How many people that you know, we know blame God for stuff that God they don't want to believe in? And turn back to the Judaism of their forefathers because it offers an easier option. Well, in that setting, the author of this letter to the Hebrews has been trying for ten chapters to show them that Jesus is better. That's the big word, better than. And then for probably two chapters now, he's trying to show them the old ways were actually faith-saved ways anyway. But what's faith? Well, we started with that. Faith is confidence in what we hope for. Assurance about what we do not see. And that's what the ancients were commended for. You go back to the old ways, here's what they did. Here's what they actually were about. Not ritual religion and all that stuff. Confidence in what they hoped God was going to do for them. He was going to come through on his promise for them. Assurance about stuff you don't yet see, but there was at least a certainty if you did, because God has promised them. And his promise does not fail. So the author of Hebrews is calling for faith from these people. Faith in view of familiarity with the great things of God, and, and they've come off the boil. Faith in the face of the lure of the past. Faith in the face of the, the lure of an, an easier life. Faith is what's called for in their hardship. In their hardship-induced crisis of faith. Now, a lot of man-made religion relies on things you can see and touch and eat. We're just looking at pickies there in the phone, aren't we? You know, from, from you know, one particular manifestation of what people do with religion. They build big buildings, they gild things, they paint nice stuff, which is lovely, but it's not the point. A lot of man-made religion relies on, relies on that stuff. You can see and touch or maybe eat. In Judaism, eat, eating is a big thing in Judaism, isn't it? Eat is always going to go down well. But faith is, like Abram did, as he said that from Ur of the Chaldees, the beginning of the history of the Old Testament people of God, faith is being confident about what we, we hope for. <coughs> Don't get have in our hand. 
assured about what we do not yet see. That, says Hebrews, is what the ancients, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, is that is what they were commended for. Worse for these people than not having all the visible in your hand before your eyes stuff from the Old Testament. Worse than what they do, worse than, than what they do see in their current experience of following Jesus, crucified Messiah, is that life following the despised, rejected figure of Isaiah 53, he was despised, rejected of men, man of sorrow was acquainted with suffering, it's leaving them feeling battered and bruised and crushed as well, to follow the one who was battered and bruised and crushed. If they just turn back, life will be more comfortable. But as Jesus himself said, whoever puts his hand to the plough and turns back is not fit for service in the kingdom. Against that setting, against that context, Hebrews is teaching a far better way. The experience of sons and daughters of the living God, what does it look like? Less wilderness and more cakes and ice creams? Time and again, God's had to take his people into the desert, hasn't he? Like he did at you know, the beginning and then with Moses and the bush. And, you know, take them off into the desert to bring them to himself. Off into the wilderness to bring them to himself. Hosea has written around this theme. And into the difficult times to bring you to something better, bring you back. All cakes and ice cream is utterly neglectful parenting, isn't it? Are you listening, kids? Right? All cakes and ice cream is a, they're not a loving parent. That's the hallmark of the parent who doesn't love you. It was the wilderness that God took Israel to bless her and to draw her to himself under the good hand of God. So let's try and get a grip on our text. Consider Jesus, says the writer of this letter. Consider Jesus. Think of him. Because in your struggle against sin, you haven't yet resisted the point of shedding your blood the way you did. Consider him. And have you completely forgotten the word that addresses you as sons, the word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son? It says, and he quotes from Proverbs 3, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. Don't just shrug it off. Think it through, consider it, and improve the experience, improve the situation through considering. And going back to God and learning what it is He's trying to teach you. Do not lose heart when He rebukes you. That is easy, isn't it? Why do I bother? Because the Lord disciplines the one He loves, and He chastens everyone He accepts as a son. Do you remember the last time we were. Some of you might remember last time we were talking about the paracetamol culture or an aspirin culture. Where pain is just the great evil. Anything that hurts has got to be bad. And then we go to the gym. You might. <laughs> I don't need to, mate. Uh, <laughs> but people do. One does. Um, you know. well, how can I express that safely? Um, people do go to the gym. And they're completely averse to pain. Oh yeah, yeah you know, look how it hurt. Bonkers, isn't it? There's sort of acknowledgement that pain can be good, but pain is bad. Oh, no, I don't get it. Discipline can hurt. But there are four basic things that are being said here. Firstly, resisting sin hasn't cost you blood. But it's cost him. Consider him. The Bible says discipline is privilege, verses 5 to 8, but don't waste the experience by not paying it proper attention or by losing heart because of it. By having it turn you from God, if they're turning to him. It says, thirdly, we loved our fathers for giving us this privilege. We came to learn to. Perhaps when we were 21 and they died, whichever was the soonest. <laughs> Verses 9 to 10, but God does it better. And fourthly, it just realistically isn't nice at the time when these things happen, does it? It isn't nice when these things happen. But are we going to waste that experience? Or benefit from it? Well, that leaves you with a big question, doesn't it? How do you make sure that you will grow in and not be crushed by hard experience? Well, the underlying assumption is, is that we need discipline. What is this discipline? Discipline. Um, it doesn't mean what the Daily Mail means by it. What does it mean? Paideia. There are three contexts in which that word gets used biblically, and they're important ones. That word gets used, first of all, for instruction. 
Discipline is a word that just means such different things in different contexts, in, you know, across the full moral spectrum. So it could be a bad thing or it could be a good thing, all the way in between. Three ways it gets used biblically. To provide instruction with the intention of forming proper habits of behavior. Provide instruction in proper habits of behavior. Now there's, there's a, a word, there's a Greek word, nuthateo, that word group focuses on instruction as to what it is that constitutes correct behavior. So I will now tell you what constitutes correct behavior. That's that word. It isn't the used here. There's the entrefo word group that appears to focus more on continuous <coughs> instruction and training in areas of skill, practical knowledge. But this word focuses on forming proper habits. Forming, pro forming proper habits of behavior. We used to, when I had the 4x4 business, we used to use this formula. Um, explanation, demonstration, instruction, practice, because we were looking for habits. We were looking for responses so that people didn't even think, they just did. Eat it. It's a good one, isn't it? Explanation, demonstration, instruction, practice. And by the time that happens, it becomes your habit. That's what this is about. Instruction, in that sort of sense. Instruction that comes with, well, well discipline. Um, training someone in accordance with proper rules of life and action and conduct. Emphasis on training them up into right conduct. So Ephesians 6 has got this stuff for families, doesn't it? And it says, fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. It's that idea of taking young life and, and making something good of it by firm handling and direction in the right ways of living. But it's got to have that firm handling and forming of character and personality. It's not hard beatings and tickings off. They're, they're there if they're needed because the other third context in which that word gets used is this. It's, it's punishment. Punished for the purpose of improving behaviour. It's clear the way the word is used in 12.11. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. You bring a child up and let it do whatever it likes. Does it end up getting a peaceful straight way through life? No, it doesn't. It ends up kicking against the cactuses, doesn't it? And that's a lot of pleasant experience. Now, why is that a problem to people? Why is discipline a problem to people? If your assessment of your own human nature is that it's basically good, then you don't need this. If your assessment of your human nature and your judgment is such that it's, it's, it's fine, then this is an imposition, and this is seen as something nasty, bad, and hostile. That's not a Christian assessment of human nature. The Christian assessment of human nature, as we are well aware, is one that our human nature is not what it ought to be. It chooses ways that are perhaps feel better, but ain't great. Feel better at the time, and then bring you grief further down the road. And so on and so forth. Scripture is very clear about that. Romans 1 through 3, chapters 1, 2, and 3 are all about that. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Foundational to our understanding of humanity, that we do wrong stuff. So for us, having that view, punishment is not a taboo subject. Because we need discipline, we need training, we need instruction. Now, mindless punishment would be an outrage, wouldn't it? Mindless punishment is abuse. We don't back off saying that. Punishment with no thought of the interests of the subject is just violence against the person. Punishment without wisdom, punishment without love, is at best counterproductive. But this use of the word paideia is not that. A fundamental position then is that we need this training. Just as you plant a tree in the garden and it comes out all shapes and sizes unless you do something with it, so it is with human nature. It comes up like a weed. We need discipline. And the things we've got for that, says Paul, is our experience of life is the hardships that come along. And the hardships we encounter are the means, means to our non-natural perfection. It doesn't come naturally. There is nothing like walking with God through real tough times, awkward and uncomfortable and pleasant as that is, to learn to walk really closely with Him. If you use it like that. But if you don't, it's easy to become embittered. That doesn't help you at all. 
We need instructing and training because we're not born perfect. We're bo not born like we ought to be. We need work on us. And it doesn't just get automatically better with the passage of time. Because experience doesn't automatically improve people. It depends on how you relate to it. Experience on its own is not what automatically improves us. And you know, there's this as well. Do you find this? Gut reactions don't always do us any favours. <laughs> We need that training. We need taking back what's good and true and right through that sort of experience. Now, bear in mind, this is not some sort of impersonal process as far as the Christian is concerned. As far as the Christian is concerned, crucial to all the Bible teaches about enduring hardship is that it is not an impersonal process. It's a personal thing. It's something we do in fellowship with God. It's in relationship with God the Father that going through times of difficulty brings about growth, strength, improvement in our walk with God. So it's as experience takes you to him that the situation improves. More than that, that you are trained and you grow. And it doesn't feel nice at the time, but it comes from a father who loves you. One of the difficult things about being a dad sometimes is to back off and let your kids have that experience. Let them do it. Let them have that experience and walk with God through it. Not to be constantly butting in, but to let them grow. Safe in the love of God. The love of God that means that he does discipline his children. Scripture he says, doesn't it? Endure hardship as discipline, because God is treating you as sons. And if he didn't, if he didn't discipline you, train you, correct you, it would be a sign that he didn't love you. If you've got a particular favourite apple tree or fruit bush or whatever it is, you take time on that. <coughs> you take trouble over it. You don't let su like suckers grow out of the ground, right? you take them off. You don't let it grow into all sorts of shapes and mess and whatever, so it won't be fruitful, you take those things off. And so God disciplines, corrects, prunes, trains his sons. Let's get trimmed with it. Bits get bent a bit to be more fruitful. Bits get held in the place and position they won't take naturally, but where they should grow if they're going to be fruitful. And it isn't a comfortable process. It's a challenging process, it's an uncomfortable process. But as we take it to Him, it is very far from senseless. And as we take it to Him, it becomes fruitful. What makes sense of it is the wisdom and the love of the one who's guiding it wisely. It's the wisdom of God that makes it fruitful. And he always does it in our interests. And that is this very crucial factor. A parent who disciplines a child because it makes the parent feel better is what sort of parent? I don't want a violent one, thank you, Callum. <laughs> a violent one. You think he's in the back playing games on that thing, but he's actually listening <laughs> all the time when he comes out with stuff. Good. Good to know he's still there and awake. You're just doing this to feel better yourself. You're not disciplining, you're, you're venting your self. The very crucial factor about all of this is the confidence of the Christian is God, that God the Father loves him or her. And he's doing this not in God the Father's selfish interest, but for the good of his offspring. It all flows from the relationship that it springs from and which drives it. It's all being a lovingly in our eternal interest. It's happening to draw us into far more beneficial relationship with him, but it's up to us whether it's going to do that or not. You've always got that opportunity to grow embittered. Some of the godliest people I've ever known are the people who've had real hard times. But it isn't just that. They've had those hard times and they've taken them to Jesus. And more than that, it's living through those hard times, through, through looking for God's way to get through it. How does that work? How does it work out that it's people who've had to go back to God with tough stuff? Well, like this, following Christ isn't intuitive, is it? Does it come naturally? 
Or have you got to be conscious about it and do it with the stuff that's happening? Yeah, I'm a Christian, I believe, but I'm just so busy, you know. Yeah, I'm a Christian, I believe, but I've got a lot on at the moment. I only take more time to read my Bible, but my bus goes so early, my work's so demanding, the children are so young. We find it easy to take our eye off the ball. There's plenty of opportunity to get your eye off the ball. We lose our focus. We lose our sense of our human weakness and inability and the importance and the urgency of prioritising our relationship with Christ, our walk with God, if we're not to make a muck up. Life gets comfortable, even easy, and other things barge in and take up the time and demand the priority. Do you remember that cruise ship? What were we talking about? A cruise or something the other day? Who's, who's that? Was it one of you guys? Talking about the cruise ships and stuff. Costa Concordia last summer. Classic, wasn't it? Was it last summer? Or Decked one? itself. Hey? Decked itself. Well, it was a lovely sunny day, wasn't it? Mm. It was a lovely sunny day. Everything in the world was great. Yeah. And there the guy was the captain of his ship. You know? No, he wasn't actually. First officer decked it. Was it? Captain wasn't on the bridge. But he took the fall forward. Somebody was mucking about. <laughs> Somebody was mucking about because there were girls on the beach or on the ship or something. Took it in too close and grounded it. It was one of those, wasn't it? It wasn't the captain. Okay, the blame for him. whichever guy it was, he was larking about on a lovely sunny day. They were plenty of distractions. That's the problem. And life can be so distracted from the important issue, like not grounding yourself. You know? Sometimes only hard experience brings us back to our senses and renews our dependence on the Lord and gets us back into training for godliness and puts us back on the ball. A little temporary affliction is needed to rekindle our relationship with God. And with eternity hanging upon the renewal of that relationship, a loving Heavenly Father does not flunk out on discipline. So here comes the conclusion. Good expecting that so soon. Here comes the conclusion. <laughs> that's fine with me, Adam. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Why draw this out? This is very simple. The discipline of a loving Heavenly Father that comes along as hardship doesn't do its job unless you use it as it's intended to be used to get stronger through letting it take you to renewed spiritual exercises to increase your dependence on the God who can help you through it. Or form you through it. So he says at the end there, strengthen your feeble arms and your weak knees, verse 11. Is it 12? It's 12. Make level paths for your feet, so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. How do you strengthen weak arms? Cast? Press-ups? Press-ups. <laughs> Press-ups. Weights. Press weights, yeah, weights. Yeah. Weights, press-ups. Farming. Farming. Good boy. Good boy, farming. Yeah, exercise. See, I'm getting to the point now. This will become as no surprise to some of you. I get to the point where physical exercise needs to be fairly gentle and progressive. <laughs> because, you know, too much too soon and it all... You've got to take care that exercise doesn't become disabling. I've been carrying a lot more about recently because it's lambing time and everything's in the shed, so everything's got to be carried. And it's got to be carried in and out of sheds and over fences and over gates and stuff, gradually strengthening that, gradually managing more. It's a time of year to make sure you get your breakfast and uh, make sure you stop a bit for lunch and stuff like that. And make sure you're getting... Good feeding, getting all the protein and stuff into your body and, and just... <laughs> I see no one looks like, I don't know what they mean. Um, so it's important to get those things in so your, your physical disciplines are there so that you're strengthening yourself, so that you're ready. And then to be pushing yourself just to the end, right, that's 75% of all I can do, pull back. Go to 85%, you're going to be pulling stuff. Yeah. There's not sufficient margin for error there. You've got to strengthen those arms, you've got to strengthen those knees, you need to be working the muscle to do it. You also need to be looking after yourself, feeding yourself properly, and then gently building up. Until one morning last week, I went a bit hard and fast over the gate, the way I used to when I was 20. And it's a mistake. And I spent the rest of the week, I've like Caleb, poor Caleb, he's been walking around the place, there'll be some dotting around behind him on a knee that's, that's fairly given away. <laughs> And he was feeling the pressure, and when the pressure got too much, I've been losing it for the rest of the week. Hardship strengthens you if you're feeding your soul, if you're renewing your relationship with God. That's the first thing. 
You have to consciously, determinedly use that experience to strengthen those weaknesses. But there's more than that. It says clear your path as well. Clear your path in a disciplined, prayerful, thoughtful pattern. Clear your path because your temptations are greater when the load is on. Clear your path. And do these things to build your closeness to your God. The things that you know will build your closeness to your God. You're reading of scripture, you're thinking about Bible, you're praying, you're encouraging of one another, you're fellowship. Otherwise, the pain of that hard experience is wasted. You still have the pain, but it's wasted in terms of the purpose that God intends it for for you. And the benefit that it should bring us is lost. Worse. You could be spiritually maimed by it the way my knee was last week. Complete frustration and its proper purpose. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. You know how to do that. You know how to do that. Make level paths for your feet. You know what clutter is going to be clear. So that the leg may not be disabled by this experience. 